evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure to see everybody tonight. Welcome to the New York Studio School. Uh, just before I begin, the usual, if everyone would just take that minute to make sure their cell phone is turned off. There's always one. Um, it is my great, great pleasure tonight to uh, be able to introduce Joe Fife, who will be speaking tonight on, if I have the title correct, his work, the work of others, and on other places. Joe Fife's paintings are shown throughout the U.S. and internationally, and have been featured in the past few years in solo exhibitions at the Nicholas Davies Gallery in New York, Mai's Gallery in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, Gallery Pitch in Paris, the Rilke Gallery in Hanoi, and J.C. Contemporary in New York, where he is currently represented. His work has been the subject of essays and reviews by writers such as Stephen Main, Lily Way, and David Cohen for Art in America, Stephanie Buman for the Brooklyn Rail, Marjorie Wellish for Balm, and Ken Johnson and Roberta Smith for the New York Times. Joe Five paintings have also been reviewed in Gay City News, New York Sun, Vietnam Net Bridges, and Vietnam News. A writer, critic, and curator, as well as a painter, Joe Fife received a Fulbright Fellowship in 2006-2007 to research contemporary art in Vietnam and Cambodia, and is a regular contributor to Art in America. And uh, by the way, his recent report from Ho Chi Minh City is in the past October issue. Uh, he also writes for Artnet, uh, Artcritical.com, and Bomb Magazine. He has curated six exhibitions, including Try a Little Tenderness at Apex Art and OM at Dorsky Projects. We are delighted to have Joe Fife back for his third lecture at the New York Studio School. Please welcome him this evening. Uh, I'm ready for the lights. Thank you. Um... We're going to go through about 22 years in about five minutes, and then we're going to slow down. Um, it was very hard for me, these are two student paintings, to really choose very much work from this period I just mentioned. Uh, this is a copy of a Corot. Um, being that I've come to this point where um, I'm almost like, um, my, my work is, is kind of like a walking protest against the kind of, um, the world of images that we're all subjected to all the time. Um, so, you know, my history has to do with almost a kind of grudge match with um, coming from, uh, you know, an education, uh, an art education that was actually very similar to um, the studio school, a lot of uh, people in the art department at PCA um, were friends with Mercedes and Leland Bell and uh, showed here, uh, lectured here. So, um, and the, the person I was closest to as an undergrad uh, that was a teacher and was most influential was Larry Day, who um, actually had an exhibition up in the gallery here the first time I lectured. And, um, <laughs> You know, he was great, except that I think it took me a long time to find out that, that uh, I don't know, that I wasn't a figurative painter, but, but uh, oddly enough, uh, things, uh, things from art school are right now more important than ever, and things when I moved to New York seem more important than ever, but at the same time, uh, being so far away from them is kind of a relief, too. Uh, this is a this is a painting from um, 1985 or uh, 86. Um, it was based on a bunch of drawings that I took in the Musée Cognac J in Paris of small figurines, and the drawings weren't good enough to make paintings from. So I made I, I, I made little clay figures from the drawings, and then um, made paintings from the figures. I um, Earlier paintings were cobbled together, were group paintings cobbled together from photographs and my own drawings into narratives, and um, I was moving away from narrative to um, first various kinds of figuration and then to the photograph for a long time. Um, there was a, like, the way I see it now is that 
I was actually working from this very isolated place, and I was very involved with um, um, voyeurism. And for years, I was, I was, um, I was kind of preoccupied with um, Edward Hopper, John Cheever, and Alfred Hitchcock. And I even wrote a paper that that sort of like tracked down all the ways that they sort of overlapped each other. Like a like Bullet Park starts with a description of a of a Hopper painting, and Psycho was based on you know Hitchcock said I want the Hopper painting High Spell the Railroad to be in the film, and there are actually all these crossovers in addition to. Uh, the ones that I saw, you know, it was kind of like trying to track down something. Um, well, I guess that's what artists do. Anyway, um, this group of work was taken from uh, tiny little sections of newspaper photographs that, um, you know, I then kind of colored and uh, blew up and, and that sort of thing. And um, the reason I put this in, it was one of these situations where a lot of the time people thought that the studies were really interesting and the paintings were kind of, you know. <laughs> um, the first time I went to Southeast Asia, um, I began to use my own photographs. Um, and here's a pretty Hitchcockian uh, photograph uh, painting. And um, this is um, after seeing the um, Better Meinhof series. Um, I started to uh, Re Xerox um, photographs I took after I put a colored gel over the top. And the, th the thing about this work for me now is I kind of see it as uh, 20 years of pictorial homework. Um, you know, I learned how to adjust tones, I learned how to um, uh, emphasize the all over quality of the of the painting by working from a photograph and then you know kind of framing before I began the thing and stuff um, but what happened to me was that I just ended up finding um, representation to be inherently melancholy um, and I've had a very hard time looking at a lot of figurative work uh, for that reason um, I think it's when um, it kind of moves away from um, what we know a painting to be in the in the most traditional sense, which is a kind of you know description of things, to when it's um, it's somehow based on the power of the image. And this is this is. Um, I'm talking from the perspective of somebody who I think was invested in the power of the image. Um, so, you know, when I came across uh, somebody like Merlin James, I was really uh, overwhelmed with the work because he had somebody that seemed to be able to manage to, to work with imagery and um, somehow avoid melancholy. Um, I, 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 I didn't really see it happen very often. Um, anyway, this painting is from, um, I think about 94, and it's called uh, Somebody Keeps Calling Me. It's, it's, uh, it's based on a photograph of Highway 61 in Mississippi. Um, and it was close to the last representational painting I did. Um, after I did this painting, I got depressed. It, it's like I had sort of like arrived at this place where I knew that I could have a career making painterly, imagist, photo-derived paintings that were kind of melancholy. Um, I just sort of saw years laid out ahead of me and uh, who I was going to talk to, what I was going to talk about, and um, I just got really depressed. I, I, uh, I, I laid on my couch and I read and I thought, I'm not going back in there until I do something that makes me feel good. And uh, this this is the funny part coming up. Uh, there's some funny paintings here. Um, what I did one day is I projected something 
I was reading onto a canvas and wiped out the rest of the image. And I suppose it was also a kind of um, post-it note to myself or something. Uh, you can make out what it says. Yeah. Yeah. That's from W.H. Auden, by the way. Um, and um, so, you know, it was, it was kind of like, this is my escape from narrative. Um, um, I also, around this time, went to Mexico, and you know, there was there was all of these things that I, I remember. I, there was like all these. One of the things that was so attractive about abstraction that I, I couldn't really figure out how to get to yet was it was a way to entertain ideas that I couldn't seem to entertain in, in figuration. And I remember. Um, uh, reading in an old uh, issue of Avalanche about how Bruce Nauman went to Europe and didn't go to any museums, but just like looked at the cities and uh, the highways and the way things were put together and stuff. So I, w I happened to go to Mexico, and um, I remember that um, I, I thought, you know, I'm not going to look at any art. I'm just going to like travel around. And as you know, some of you know that Mexico is an amazing place. It's got its own kind of aesthetic and a lot of it's a lot of it's hand painted. I mean, there are towns you go into where the entire town, you know, the buildings are painted uh, different colors, and you know, every every sign in town is hand painted, and they have this this way of using paint, where um, you know, like the yellow curbs on the street, there's like skines of uh, yellow paint dripping off of the bottom. Or you go into the churches, and they, you know, they whitewash the churches like it's holy water or something that's dripping down on like 400 year old carved furniture and plastic flowers you know it's heavy with paint and um, so the the background of this painting was painted before I went to Mexico and then when I came back I figured out a way to, to move the words in um, so um, this is from a, a catalog entry in a Gwen John catalog And basically, not with this painting, but one day um, I crossed out, uh, this is how it happened, I crossed out um, the words in a painting and it looked fine. And I thought, oh, that's how you make an abstract painting. Yeah. Um, that's, that's how it happened. Um, but what I do think was, in 1977, when I first moved to New York, I saw um, Blinky Palermo's Times of Day, and then I saw um, saw the the uh, that and a few and another and people of New York City at uh, Dia in '88, along with uh, some Emi Knobel work. And like to this day, I'm convinced that since 1988, that work was just digging in there. Um, I, it's the only experience I've ever had that was kind of like a, a, a really slow, um, you know, incident on the road to Damascus, where it, it, it uh, to this day, there was something about, um, the way I understand it, now, there's something about the imaginative freedom in um, those Palermos that uh, uh, was really uh, transforming. Um, you know, and the other thing about it was that I think it was the first time I really understood um, um, a, a kind of um, physical, spiritual state that took place in a painting. You know, I um, the only thing it, it seemed like to me uh, was was tantric painting. Um, you know that um, the tantric books were floating around art school. Um, when I was there. As a matter of fact, my first painting teacher was a, was a Buddhist um, who told us that we had to become empty vessels to receive the energy from the still life. Um, but she was great. Um, anyway, um, this was the kind of stuff I was looking at to make paintings. I had um, I had expanded, for me, I, I, ha I expanded the idea of the painting to become anything that was painted, and a painter was anybody that painted. Um, that's how these, these first abstractions came about. So um, these were from looking at 
you know, fire hydrants in Little Italy with seven coats of paint on them and um, boats, uh, which is coming up here. Uh, this was in Palermo. Um, these aren't uh, kind of necessarily in order. This is kind of like trying to organize Granny's Closet where um, there's pictures I take as uh, just mental notes and they show up sometimes years later. Um, there is another thing that I think that this might be the the right time to read. Um, there's two pretty important uh, statements um, that have to do with how I understand my work. Um, the first one is um, the uh, film writer Peter Wallen on Andre Bazin. Um, one might consider photography in this sense as a molding, the taking of an impression by a manipulation of light. Uh, Bazin repeatedly stresses the existential bond between sign and object, which was the determining characteristic of the indexical sign. Jean Renoir could reveal what permitted everything to be said without chopping the world up into little fragments that would reveal the hidden meanings in people and things without disturbing the unity natural to them. The mystical tone of this kind of argument reflects, of course, the curious admixture of Catholicism and existentialism which had formed Bazin. Yet it also develops logically from an aesthetic which stresses the passivity of the natural world rather than the agency of the human mind. Bazin's aesthetic asserted the primacy of the object over the image the primacy of the natural world over the world of signs. Bazin was deeply influenced by Mounier's insistence that the interior and the exterior, the ideal and the material, the spiritual and the physical were indissolubly linked. And the other uh, piece of writing is shorter. It's Yves Allen Bois on Matisse. Uh, speaking of several still lifes of oysters painted at the end of 1940, Matisse notes that he required fresh oysters each session. They had to have the right luster and smell for it was his appetite that he wanted to render. Matisse, in effect, needs the full presence of object and or motif, a materiality that prompts his initial impulse to paint or draw. He needs to involve his own perceptual apparatus so as to identify with his motif. Like St. Thomas, he could not believe his eyes alone. To possess this full presence takes time. Rendering something on canvas requires a slow impregnation of the senses, and the presence of the subject can be lost. So, you know, I had gone to this position, this place where I wasn't rendering an image. I was, I was really involved in this kind of immediacy of what you did when you put you know, what you were in, a, in the studio with paint and canvas, like the, like squeezing the paint out of the tube became major. Um, what my arm did, uh, you know, became, you know, the subject. So the fact that I had a brush that was this wide and I liked to do this was really important, which was very refreshing. Um, this is a gate in Cambodia. Um, uh, that's in um, Turkey. And um, this series of paintings, if you notice the, um, the underpainting, um, it seemed that there was a, a consciousness of, um, that's an emphasis too, of, um, of the physicality of the painting. Um, yeah, I'd begun writing reviews around that time, and um, I was actually assigned to write a, a, a Steve Perino review. And I remember just looking at the work, which I had known for a while, but you know, the, the thing that's so great about writing is, at least for me, is that it's a way of actually possessing the, the art object for a while. and. Um, you know, I remember thinking, physical, yeah, yeah, physical. You know, he's kind of, he's fairly unique uh, that way. Uh, I th and especially, you know, uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, so, um, 
That's in Palermo. So the, 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 these aren't exactly in order, but um, I became more conscious of the fact that I was dealing with this physical object that um, you know, hangs on the wall and reflects colored light. This is what they tell you in art school, but um, it was something that I, I, I thought was, um, was central. And I was looking at things like, uh, like architecture. Um, I used to love to go to the Met and look at Islamic pots that just had like a dot in the middle. Um, if I was looking at art, I was looking at stuff like that. This is uh, Michael Graves' building in uh, Suffolk County. This is called Red Lip. It's about that big. And the uh, earlier one is about nine foot high. So they, they, they ranged in two sizes, kind of like really big and small. This is called Muscle Car. Um, there was a point where, um, you know, I had gone to London and actually made it a point of looking up Merlin James. Uh, and uh, then when I um, got back here, I met Jim Hyde and um, we put this show together. Uh, I found this gallery and we had a three person works on paper show. And I had an idea what, um, what Jim was going to do because I'd seen the drawings. And I had an idea what Merlin was going to do. And I, I thought that, you know, this would be a good time to, um, to do watercolor. I'm always hearing about watercolor. I never did any watercolor. So I did about um, 50 or 60 watercolors and, and I came up with about 12. And the thing that happened, this is Merlin and this is Jim, Merlin, <coughs> me was that I would work on these watercolors up to a point where um, I'd add another element and all of a sudden the light would die. It was that palpable, you know? I would just take the thing too far and, uh, and the light would die. So there was more of this, um, this physical sensation of, of this, this light object. And um, so that, you know, really had its effect on the work. I discovered the burlap by accident. Uh, I ordered some jute and uh, it turned out to be burlap. It, w it wasn't this painting, it was an earlier painting. But, um, you know, I stretched it up and realized that there was enough physicality in the burlap that um, I didn't need... Uh, <clears throat> I didn't need the uh, relief elements anymore. This is called <clears throat> Road to Ephesus. Um, a lot of the um, marks that I made were made with stencils. Um, there was something about uh, the... Um, there was so much subjectivity in the, um, the burlap already that putting down a kind of loose mark was too much. So um, I hardly ever used a freehand mark uh, on, um, on any of these paintings unless there was a lot of rehearsal um, or it's, it's something that didn't work the first time and I'd have to like start all over again. This is the road to Ephesus. <laughs> And, uh, you know, the Matisse reference had to do with the fact, this is in uh, Kyoto, is that, you know, I wasn't working, when I was making these paintings, I wasn't necessarily, um, you know, working from um, some idea that I had, but I had a tendency to be able to identify the painting with a feeling or a place from before. Um, you know, like the painting wouldn't be finished until I, I, I said to myself, oh, I know what that is. That's the da 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 you know, and then I sort of understood the painting. And uh, that sort of explains a lot of these, and they all happen to be um, places. Um, 
This is uh, Marcel Breuer's uh, UNESCO building in Paris, which I now hear is being refurbished. But um, uh, I went to Paris with my uh, now ex-girlfriend in 99 and uh, a book of um, and an architectural guidebook and uh, ended up looking at a lot of paintings. But the, um, the um, UNESCO building um, was an image of modernism that had been kind of distressed and worn down over time. And it seemed like another good model for making paintings, especially, you know, these kind of distressed uh, paintings that I was making. Um, uh, the the uh, the process was opening up all these kinds of options that I didn't have before. Like for, like there was a point where I um, I put myself in this position where any painting I could do I could I could replicate um, any number of times. So I became this expert at mixing the exact color and figuring out ways to repeat whatever I did already. Um, which was, so this one actually, um, you know, has two pieces of painter's tape on it. And what, what happened was I kept adding more elements and it never worked. So then I would, you know, exactly, um, you know, get a new piece of prime burlap, stretch the thing up, you know, completely accurately down to like the 16th of an inch, you know, get a stencil made to put the tape back where, you know, paint the tape where it was with the same tape color I had copied exactly. And finally, the third time, I realized that it was enough. I didn't need another element. Um, and, you know, it was the way I, the same kind of light started appearing that um, appeared in the watercolors. Um, so this, this group um, of three paintings was the first show I had at uh, Jay Grimm. This is not supposed to be doing this. Now, suddenly the forward is backward and vice versa. This is backward, yeah. This is a problem. Can somebody just move that back like about 10 notches? I can't seem to, you know, get it to reverse. The other way. Okay, great, thank you. So these three paintings were my first uh, my first show at uh, Jake Grimm on 28th Street. Um, and what happened was after the first trip to Paris, um, Peter Soriano, um, I reviewed a show there. It was my first review for Art in America. And then Peter Soriano said, you know, why don't you come over and I'll introduce you to a bunch of French painters. And I wanted to do, um, I actually wanted to curate a show and I could never get anybody to take a French show. Um, so the studio school was nice enough to say, well, why don't you do a lecture on it? So that was what happened to that. Um, but I wanted to just quickly kind of recap um, what was going on with that because uh, tell you the truth, uh, there wasn't anything going on in New York that interested me. Um, you know, I couldn't stand Williamsburg art, all that little fussy, tiny Mark stuff. And um, uh, th this was like this whole other way of looking at painting that seemed to be, uh, had been ignored here and is still ignored, you know, after like 30 years or so. They have a whole other concept of, of what the, 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 the painting is. You know, it's very different from Greenberg. It's about the tableau and um, 
it's uh, it's political and it's um, um, linguistic and it's also the way, the most interesting way that I understand the tableau now is is that where Greenberg um, was always talking about flatness. They, they see the tableau as being this thing that has this kind of depth to it. it one of the ways it, it, it goes back to the past is the idea of the tableau was the finished painting from the academy. But the, one of the latest interpretations I heard was that early du Buffet, you know, which was just kind of that scrawled in the mud kind of painting, was the tableau without, the, without skin. So it was actually kind of revealing um, the under underside of of the painting. So this thing had this kind of depth to it. So they ended up playing with um, not exactly depth, but 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 the kind of space in 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 flatness that we don't really deal with here the same way. This is. Um, Mar Thank you. Yeah, Martin Barnett, who's actually a favorite painter of mine, even though I can never remember his name. Um, this was um, um, this is Jerome Bouturin, who was my first Art in America review, who um, you know replicates um, the weave, and then while this this weave pattern is still wet, he improvises into the wet uh, uh, ground. Um, um, Antai makes these paintings by taking it off the stretcher and crumpling it up. Um, this is a real scan of this. Of this, this is um, Viala. Most of the work is off the stretcher. Um, it's also very um, Islamic and North African influenced, I think. <laughs> Um, this is Alex Lamelladere, who I reviewed, who um, makes a mark on the right of the canvas and then turns it and makes a mark and builds up the painting that way. There's a, a studio full of these paintings. I think there's like, there must be four or five done a month and um, you know, it's been going on for like 20 years or something, and they do change from one to one in this in this subtle kind of way. Um, this was a whole way of approaching painting that that really kind of impressed me because um, you know it, it was it, it wasn't pictorial, and if it was, it was really trying to thwart pictorialism and bring it towards. You know this kind of physicality. Um, this is uh, Marie Claude Bugaud, and this is uh, Bernard Piforetti, who always puts a stripe down the middle and then copies the same thing on the other side. Who um, comes out of Newman? Um, a really weird way to come out of Newman. Um, but you know, I think he's one of the great uh, one of the great abstract painters of our time. Actually, um, this is Miguel Mont, and this is Nicolas Chardon, who is act was actually a student of Piferetti's. And the thing that I found so interesting about Chardon was the idea of a painting that was the, the tableau as imitating um, its historical period. So that, if you can see the edge of this thing, there was this kind of um, checkered standard French tablecloth that then was stretched. And he would put a constructivist image on top of it, but follow the lines of the stretched canvas. And it was the idea of modernism being distorted by postmodernism. And you know, it kind of, it kind of, um, complemented the ideas I had about um, using these kind of modernist tropes except um, with uh, materials that were kind of dealt with uh, an impoverishment and time and wear and, and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> So this was um, when I had my exhibition in Ho Chi Minh City where I did 14 paintings in 10 days. I didn't paint for six months, I just kind of saved it all up. Um, 
and there was this uh, walkway to the back that had all these loose stones over it. Um, and you know, it had this, ref this, the, this, where there was this reflecting pool. And uh, I remember I, um, I emailed um, Michael Smith about how I was going to have the show in Vietnam where there's a reflect, an empty reflecting pool in the middle and four columns and a tile floor. And he said, what are they serving at the opening, nectar? So uh, I got really involved with the um, associative um, properties of the burlap. Um, I saw it as cast concrete, as stone. Um, I didn't know where the cloth came from. And eventually I figured out that it, that it was from two places. It was from looking at rivers from the air and how that cuts through a landscape and the way Buddha figures are draped with cloth in these places like Angkor Wat. Um, this is um, Ho Chi Minh City. This is still me installing. That little painting that um, we'll see in more detail soon is one of the scattered stone paintings. Um, so, you know, it, 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 for me, it wasn't, it wasn't really, uh, it didn't become a difficult task to get a likeness in a painting anymore, but I guess, you know, it was about this investment in physicality and then needing, um, uh, it wasn't really motivation. It was kind of this immersion in a place where I sort of had a reason to make a painting. Um, you know, I began to depend on um, some kind of extensive environment just to make a couple of simple marks. Um, and I think it was, you know, it kind of reversed everything that had been going on earlier. Um, this was before I moved there. I was making the little ones in my hotel room. Um, I had I did the ten paintings, and then I took this trip up to um, uh, Sapa, which is way up uh, north in the mountains in uh, in Vietnam in '04, and. Um, this color um, was also the color of dragon fruit, which was in season then, and I used in this painting. This is still the painting from the Vietnam show. Um, this is called uh, Wonder Bread. So these are all pictures from Sapa. Now the thing that happened was Uh, these are uh, incest, incense drying. Rice fields. Oh, that's the last slide. Okay, um, till the next carousel. So I, you know, I went up and I traveled through Sapa and I came back and the show was, you know, the show was hung and um, I was kind of, um, I don't know exactly flabbergasted or overwhelmed or embarrassed, but I realized, or I hadn't realized before how um, I had kind of um, aestheticized um, uh, impoverished rural environment into the paintings. And I sort of actually wondered if, ever, if you know, people coming to the opening were going to realize that. Um, <laughs> And um, the, the, I think the lesson had to do with um, the, um, first I thought that, you know, I'd gotten away from um, the, um, the total amorality of imagery to just uh, be faced with the, um, the, the total amorality of making art, uh, you know. Um, uh, this is, uh, Carl Andre had become really important to me because um, one of my um, one of the things that I thought about one of one of the touchstones with the work became the idea that um, with Andre more than anybody else I really knew it seemed that that um, 
the materials, including like the, the workers who ever made the materials, the audience and the artist were, were on the same plane. I, I, I couldn't really think of any other work where there, there was that kind of equality. And I thought it was a really uh, interesting balance. I thought it was something to kind of aspire to. And, you know, I still think about it a lot. Um, this is the closest thing I ever made to an abstract self-portrait. Um, and this is an example of when I did put a, um, a freehand brush stroke down. But uh, what happened, as happens with a lot, with a lot of these paintings, is that um, it was rehearsed, meaning that originally it was going to be a painting where I had fit in um, a piece of cloth down the center, and um, that wasn't working, so then I just tried that. But it, it, I had gone through like building the stretcher, uh, b building the painting, and then rejecting it before I tried another method. Um, more than uh, the same thing with this painting. This, this, the original version had a had a cloth stripe, um, and you know they. Um, the breaks were dictated by the same way that I had I had decided that this was was going to dictate how this painting worked. The the burlap came in five feet um, rolls with finished edges. So when it got to the bigger works, um, you couldn't go more than five feet across. So there was a way of kind of attaching the cloth as a separator to bridge to the next piece of burlap and. Um, the idea of the material kind of dictating what you could do with it uh, was a really interesting um, way of moving ahead for me, or m just moving. Um, this um, this is called Stone South. It's the name of a, um, a, uh, a studio at Yano. This is a um, Vagabond's backpack in Kyoto. This is called For Alex. Now this is a painting that um, was sliced out. This is about uh, 60 inches high, but it was sliced out of a nine foot painting. Every one of these paintings seems to have come about a different way. Um, this is Chartres. Which is simply um, what 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 happened is I I was continually feeding myself various metaphors for this this burlap. Um, I think it was um, it really must have been a five or six year um, dialogue with this one material. It just uh, it just keep kept opening up um, more things for me, or for some reason. Um, I, I, I kept it alive through what I projected onto it. Um, and mainly what I do and what I, what I do now and what I did with all these works is more than anything else, I would staple them up and then take them off and take them apart. Um, Besides the fact that they're they're physical objects, um, the process is pretty much physical. Um, you know, um, most of the paintings either are done well, not all of them, but um, a number of them are done more than once to get it right. Or um, there's plenty of rejects, um, and things come about in um, new ways, like. Uh, a lot of the time, you know, I would try out painting something on there by doing a substituting a piece of paper or something, and that would just that one just stayed. Um, this is one of the few drawings that um, I made during trying to figure out how to do a painting. Um, this is called for Steve. This is one of the first cloth paintings. Um, This is, I don't remember the title of this painting. This is in London. This, hmm? 
the last painting? The last, the the last slide. slide. That was just a street scene in London. Uh, this is called Kyoto Rain. I'm getting less poetic now. No, no. Oh, well, come I, now. Now in my yeah. <laughs> Were you thinking about Burri at all? You know the Italian painter. Um, Just his use of, of burlap. Not really. Um, you know, I saw the show. I mean, people are always mentioning him, but you know, it's kind of like. Uh, I don't think you really control very much who influences you and at least if I understand my experience at all it's kind of like like a page in a book will like flip by with somebody's painting in it maybe I'm exaggerating but and that'll influence me I'll just get it and it'll go and it'll, it'll be in there and I'll put it this way a better way to say it would be um, David Reed was telling me there's a, a, a new Palermo show up somewhere in Europe. And I just said to him, you know, I never need to see a Palermo again. I mean, it, 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 what would be the, you know, this, it, it's in there, um, it, it's doing what it's did and doing what it's doing. And, it, you know, I think with Bori, maybe I saw it once at one time. I mean, I know Bori. I never really looked at it. I never really liked it very much. Um, okay, one more question. Are, are your strikes down the center related to Newman 6? We're going to get to them. Okay. Can we, I have a, I have a whole zip section coming up. <laughs> um, but thanks for the question. Um, maybe this is one of the first ones. Um, this one also had a yellow um, band down the side. And once again, you know, uh, there's this um, Buddha cloth uh, stone thing. See the way the this is Sri Lanka. I um, I was thinking about these as um, abstracted paintings where um, I'm, I'm not even really that involved with paint anymore. Um, and I, I thought to myself that I've, I've gone from the totalitarianism of images to the democracy of cloth. Yeah. And I'm kind of serious. Um, before we get to the zips, there was um, oh, there's the the drawing section. Um, this is this group kind of goes back. Fr it's from the present, almost the present, to about um, 02 when I was already working with the burlap and I was in Laos and I couldn't figure out. I, I wanted to make um, works on paper that somehow related to the paintings I was doing, but I had no idea how to do it. And I was in this market in Laos. And there was this big roll of um, this crummy, used, water-damaged, handmade paper in a bucket. And uh, I think there must have been about 25, 30 sheets of it. I'm still working from it. Um, some of them, some of it's been, you know, all over the world, two or three times. They, some of it, you know, moves along at a much different pace than the paintings. The paintings get done in a couple of days. The drawing may start in 02 and, and get finished in 04 uh, or 05. And when I originally was working on them, um, I was just putting down pieces of um, watercolor, usually with the stencil. And what happened at one point is I started replacing them with um, other pieces of paper sometimes the same paper and sometimes a different color. So I cut out the, the dot, you know, I'd, I'd carve it out and then I'd sort of inset it because, you know, I have this light thing where, you know, the idea of, of slamming a piece of paper on top of another for some reason just seems like blocking the light to me. The same way that in all the paintings that the cloth just kind of like overlaps the uh, burlap slightly 
and then uh, you know it's basically a continuous surface. It has something to do with the idea of the light, and it's just some idiosyncratic thing. Um, but what happened was. Um, it ended up uh, down the road, as drawings do, transform the paintings. So uh, nothing you're looking at here is, is technically a collage because only the edges are glued. It's, it's a, they're all always um, a continuous surface. And one of the things that happens is a lot of the time uh, the B side ends up being the A side. Um, which I find really satisfying because it's just fresher. Um, I have a tendency to really dislike paintings that I feel have been stared at by the artist for a long time. Um, they kind of die. Um, so it's one way to kind of reverse that is like, you know, you're kind of working on this composition or whatever you want to call it, but then like at the last minute, you realize that the other side is actually better. And it's one of these mind things where, um, you know, I'm kind of thinking it's the other side, but then I know it's this side. Well, maybe this one will be this side. And whenever it happens, it always, it always fools, it always, it always fools me out. I never, I never really know when it's going to happen. <laughs> So these are all about 32 by 36. Uh, I put this in here because this is one drawing where I was very conscious that I was, I was trying to kind of replicate looking at the ground uh, somewhere, actually somewhere in Spain. This is a slide from 1989 from Chiang Mai that um, just seems to me to be um, such a prescient, prescient uh, uh, image for, for some of what I've been involved with, with this concrete and the way that if you use the pigment, it kind of soaks into the ground. Um, you know, in some ways, um, now that I'm at the end of this love affair with burlap, um, it's kind of interesting to, um, to have been here. Um, I don't think I'd ever been in a place before where I was able, where I, you know, I didn't move very quickly because I really kind of liked where I was. And I don't think I really ever felt that way before. Um, there's a couple of, like, the, those abstractions, those first abstractions that were kind of based on the boat. Uh, were like that. Like, I didn't really care where I was going. I was really happy to just move right there. And apparently, one, one inevitably seems to progress. Um, but I, um, it was really nice not to for once. And um, you know, this painting came about. It actually had a big uh, orange band through the middle. And I was gluing it up. And I lifted it up from the floor. And it just had some, you know, a couple of pieces of tape on it from the floor. So I kind of very artistically replaced them with um, other um, watercolored handmade paper scraps. And um, <clears throat> it was too much. So I ripped out the orange strip from the middle and got a different canvas and pulled it together. This is called The Little Prince. This, I don't know what it's called or where it is. Um, these paintings, um, I don't really know about the Newman thing. Um, you know, the thing about uh, the thing about Newman and just about every abstract expressionist that is so interesting to me is that they all seem to break the language in some way. And, um, you know, Newman did this really great job of breaking the language. But at the same time, I was I was just as interested in the format. Um, and I don't really know remember exactly when I went to Chartres, but there was something about what didn't come out in the, the Chartres slides is the um, 
the incredible subtleties of the facade of Chartres um, from pollution and whatever where, whatever else did, did to it and how I was just like amazed at how much it looked like the kind of um, irregularly sized burlap I was using and the fact that it did have these pieces of color here and there in it from the stained glass you know and um, so I think that that there must have been some kind of equivalence going on between looking at a cathedral and looking at a Newman and you know wanting to make these verticals and Later, I also think that, you know, Piforetti's uh, divisions all were ways of, of breaking it. Um, but originally, especially with this one, there was there was the idea of of just adding a third element that uh, that was as different as possible. There was the there was the ground, there was the paint mark on the ground, and then there was um, this cloth. Like this painting um, is called Oliveros Night because I was listening to pa Pauline Oliveros the night I decided it was finished. Um, I did it three times, where which meant that um, I had, you know, there, there wasn't any way I could use the burlap and repaint it. So if it didn't work, that was it. Um, so, you know, I had to rebuild the painting from scratch every time where I got the, the new cloth for the center and then tried the mark again with, with, um, uh, with a stencil. And what, what usually happened through all this, the mark was always so heavy, either I'd be rubbing like crazy or finally um, it would, um, uh, I just, it was too heavy and I'd have to start over again. You know, and the, re the you know, all those years of doing that, that image homework and working from photographs, I think what I really learned to do was I learned to adjust, uh, I, I got really good at figuring out um, how to make tones work. So, um, you know, it was working on this other level where, where usually what happened would be the paint would go down so heavy that the tonal range would be destroyed and I'd have to start over again until it was close enough. This is that um, scattered stone stencil appearing again on the right. Then this is actually, this jumps ahead of it, but this is the last um, uh, zip painting so far. This is called La Gloire, because it seemed kind of Napoleonic. Um, but uh, as much as I was um, enamored with uh, the subtleties of the burlap, there was this idea about what would happen if there was more color added. and. Um, you know, like I said, the, the thing that was really nice about these paintings is that it, it was interesting to be someplace where I knew where I was. And, you know, I wanted to figure out a way to spend time there before, you know, I just liked being there. Somebody came to my studio at one point and said, you know, well, where do you see these paintings going? And I said, nowhere. I like it here, you know. Um, and, you know, I found out that I was interested in this kind of, you know, nature and culture opposition and physical spiritual. And, you know, I was actually being informed about what I was interested in through these paintings, the way I saw it. Um, but, um, you know, what happened in Sri Lanka is I started trying to figure out how to introduce color in this, this scheme of things, even though... I was still looking at, you know, this kind of waterlogged stuff. Um, so this came after, after there. So these these couple of paintings were named after roads in, in Sri Lanka. Um, I think that one's called Unawatuna. And um, so then all hell broke loose. Um, this was an approximation of trying to remember what one of the windows at La Chapelle looked like. 
Um, this painting is called Ao Dai, which I didn't figure out what it was until about six months later. Um, in a couple of minutes when we go to the digital images, I'll show you what an Ao Dai is. Um, this is called Huan Kiem, which is a lake in uh, Hanoi. So this was all in the show that I did um, last February. This is uh, a clothesline in Laos in 02. And this is um, the first, I, I set up a studio, I had, I, um, on the digital images I have some images of the show in um, Hanoi I had this time last year and um, I was there through the winter and then I went back to Cambodia. I went I went back to Southeast Asia and two months in Cambodia because uh, the Fulbright was paying me. I had, I had covered all my obligations. I pushed out plenty of text because it was a, a journalist journalist's um, Fulbright. You really, as far as I knew, you couldn't get a painter's Fulbright at that time. Um, so I set up the studio in Phnom Penh and I had brought some fabric with me, brought a bunch of burlap and um, I didn't use it. Um, I started working with the cloth. And once again, this is like, this is like the back of the original painting. So that's a brown patch. And as, as in the drawings and the paintings, um, you know, the fabric kind of meets up and uh, so you're, you're, there's a, basically a continuous plane even though that the surface is uneven. These are just called non-pen one, two, three, four, five. This is, um, this is the newer drawings from, from that time. What happened was actually is I finally figured out a way to use the color that felt like the earlier work, um, and it wasn't you know it wasn't uh, some kind of uh, semiotic leap or anything. It's it was you know uh, it's it, it finally felt right. So I, I felt like I could move on or move somewhere else. So these are all about uh, 60 inches high except for the first blue one. And then this is a drawing, um, this last group is from Switzerland from the summertime. This is um, the beginning of a series that that came from, I don't know where it came from. Um, I brought, I bought all this, this um, this brown cloth in Cambodia that has, it's a kind of um, dark auburn that um, there's some, uh, you know, there's some bunch of monks that wear this. I mean, I don't know where, where it is, where they are, but um, it's one of these monk colors. It's also um, one of the colors that Vietnamese Buddhist monks wear sometimes, which you hardly ever see. Um, they pretty much, they're not like the rest of the countries over there, as some of you know, it's a different sect. Um, but it, I re, I, I, it occurred to me that I was making a parable. So the one on the left was the priest, and the middle one was the nun, and the right one was the bride. And this is in progress, I don't know where it's going yet. Um, this is another painting where the back turned out to be the front. This is a painting uh, called After Corot, um, which just came from being in Paris and looking at the Corots. Um, after all of this kind of travel stuff, um, I feel like this newer work is actually drawing on um, um, this affection for 
the particular there's a particular kind of sobriety in French painting that runs from say Chardin through um, Cezanne, Brock, Fautrier, um, Corot, and uh, all of this you know the, that earlier uh, that earlier parable work all seems to be drawing on that. This painting is called Church Interior. The 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 mustard uh, is a little off, but if we can move to the images for the final roundup here, uh, there's a better image of that. Did I answer your zip question? Yeah. Where was the show last February? The show at what? Where was the show last February? JG Contemporary Uptown. I had a drawing show uh, in March, too. But um, I wouldn't recommend anybody showing now. Any questions while we're waiting? <laughs> Except about the drawing show. Did you ever think of the Hinton at the Burlap, kind of a Catholic thing, you know, that block? Hmm? Did you ever think of Hinton? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, hair shirts. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then the ashes. Ashes. My ashes and sackcloth. So this, um, I think I just do this, don't I? Go <laughs> This is my um, homage to Hanoi series. With I brought a bunch of cloth with me and and worked out of uh, this hotel room up there. One of the things I had mentioned about the Ho Chi Minh City show that. What's really weird is I did this press conference and I was talking about, they actually brought in all these people from the press and some of them from um, like like old, old school communist press. And this one guy, after I explained the abstraction, he, he said to me in this really kind of the most disdainful parental voice like, how do you expect anybody to get that from these? And it was kind of like, it's the first time I ever heard that, that you know, Iron Curtain, um, you know, disdain that I, I, I suppose is kind of like falling out now. But it was really weird to like hear that about, you know, have that come at you directly, uh, you know, something out of the unbearable lightness of being, you know. Um, Some of these were also in the, the February show. Um, you know, by then I was comfortable with the fact that I was kind of drawing on, you know, aspects of, um, you know, street architecture and the way things are put. I'll, I'll show you some examples. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, given your interest in French, you know, painting, you know, contemporary painting, modern painting, does that French, which obviously occupied Vietnam, um, exist culturally in the contemporary art of that place? Or did the communist part of that run that out of town? I mean, you know what I'm saying? There is... Um, Sexual French painting thing in France and Vietnam. They set up the, the first to call the Bazaar in Vietnam. It was the only one over there. They didn't do one in Laos or, or uh, Cambodia. And they were teaching Impressionism in the 30s. Um, in the South, they, you know, there was a con you know, kind of a, something of a continual contact with what was going on. But... Um, in general, there's there there isn't that much continuity in the north, and most native Vietnamese artists have just gone right into contemporary forms. Um, 
There's one guy who I have a couple of images of who's my favorite Vietnamese painter who uh, is, um, this was the show in Real 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 This is me talking about my work to uh, a group of Hanoi artists. And, you know, the thing that was great about it was is that, you know, I was showing um, a lot of these Vietnamese images with, um, just like I was showing you, and there was a way, there was a way that, um, uh, you know, they, they sort of got the work and they really liked it. So that was really gratifying because, you know, what I was really doing over there is I was in this kind of dialogue with the, the general atmosphere of the country. It's why I, I kept going back. It's just for sensibility reasons. Um, you know, it's a very, to me, it's a very earthy, elegant culture. Um, Traditionally, I'm not really that crazy about a lot of Vietnamese contemporary art, but um, you know, I'm, I was crazy about the general the general culture. So I just um, that's an out that woman's wearing an ao dai, the traditional Vietnamese silk uh, uh, garment that that painting was named after. So this this is what was influencing you know the Hanoi paintings, um, but th these are actually um, well that's in the Red River in Hanoi. That's my Hanoi studio hotel room, and these are just a couple of better pictures of the uh, Ho Chi Minh City show from '04. These were a lot of these paintings were shown in uh, in J J Grimm in in uh, 05 too. This is just something. Um, this is kind of like the scrapbook part. Uh, this is um, an image that a Vietnamese sculptor sent me. This this is this just feels so much like Hanoi in the fall to me. Um, it's the one part of last year that I still kind of feel melancholy about, and I don't even know why. Um, but I thought that was really um, beautiful. Scarlet Bee on the Spring Road. So it's a spring. I, don't know, I thought it was fun. So this is uh, Trung, Trung Tring Tin, who was a um, wonderful artist, uh, really old now, uh, was, a, was a film actor in Hanoi in the 50s. And then uh, he made these paintings on newspaper all through the, the war in Hanoi. And everybody else, all the other artists were making propaganda posters and stuff like that. And so he was kind of ostracized. There's like hundreds of these things. And uh, you know, I, he, he lives in the South now and I met him and uh, I, I actually wrote something about him for Art Critical. And he, he, uh, he had a translated form. He really liked being written about by an artist. So it was really, it was really satisfying. Um, except that a lot of the work is falling apart due to the bad weather. Um, I think he'd be a great person to have a show at the gallery here. These are just um, um, more of uh, uh, what uh, things that influence my paintings. This is Cambodia. This is uh, this this building here is kind of an extreme example of uh, you know modernism after after the modernist ideal. And these are just some of the paintings in. Uh, in context, I don't. I'm um, um, Hans Josephson, who I don't, I can't really get into in depth. But the the article I've been working on and on for a year is coming out in the um, January or in America. Um, when I came across this show at Bloom about a year and a half ago, it was like the the biggest experience since Blinky Palermo, where I couldn't even go to Chelsea afterwards. I just, it just kind of, he just blew everything away for me. And I got to know him a bit. And um, the thing that's so interesting about him is 
he's pretty much only interested in early Christian art between 11 and 1300, Cezanne, and maybe a couple of things about modernism. He has this idea about, he seems to like um, the beginning of movements, but he seems to think that as, as soon as like there's a kind of naturalistic extrapolation on a style that something's lost. And um, I was really taken with the work. Um, this is just a close up of the pattern on this painting. This is the church interior that I thought influenced that painting called Church Interior. You know, I stretched the thing up and there was something about the chastity of the painting that for some reason, at least at that moment, legitimized it for me. This is um, another one in the series. This is the monk that stayed in Switzerland. And this is just recent work in the studio, some of it untitled. This is actually, um, seems to be a combination of, you know, um, the democracy of cloth and stained glass. And this is the series uh, as it stands. The road, the bride, the priests, the nun, the door, the bed, the hill. Okay, um, thank you very much. Any questions? Hi. Well, you know, I think what happened to me largely was that I sort of arrived at this model for what abstraction was and then just kind of started, stopped thinking about art and just started being influenced by whatever kind of came my way, you know. Um, the, the, the one thing that, that happened when I made the switch from figuration to abstraction, when I, I tried to explain it to myself was I thought, I'm really curious to go here and my job is to, my, my first loyalty as an artist is to my curiosity. So that's kind of the way I've been operating, you know. Does that answer your question? How did you answer your, uh, the Iron Curtain question? <laughs> um, well, you know, I actually have a transcript somewhere. Um, the one thing I remember that I did say is that um, artists, uh, even though I haven't been in the, the country for very long and I have a very superficial reading of it, I said sometimes artists um, are very good at superficial readings and can probably tell you maybe something good about the country. I remember that was the one good response I had. Well, mainly it's because I think it's really oppressive here. Um, the trouble is, is that I've been, especially to Vietnam enough now, so I know how oppressive it is there. 
because, you know, even when I was there in 04, I had to have all the titles, you know, I went through the press conference with that guy, all the titles had to be translated into Vietnamese and submitted to the Ministry of Culture in advance before they, they approved the show. Um, a lot of what's in the uh, report from Ho Chi Minh City is about how they censor their artists. But originally for me, it was just, um, it had a lot to do with um, the kind of erasure, uh, the, 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 the boundary between culture and nature was much more permeable, you know, and uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's accidental, you know, Be even in Vietnam, they think that, that there's spirits and trees and things like that, so they're not gonna level uh, as much as they're building like crazy, I notice they kind of leave more trees around the perimeter, even where a skyscraper goes up, than we do here. We would just plow everything out. You know, even things like that. Um, so I think it's the main thing. It's this kind of nature culture thing is, is really um, uh, different. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about the aestheticization of damage or corruption, actually, which might be a better term, and as a juxtaposition to violence, which is, I don't see violence in your work, but it seems like there's a fascination with corruption and damage. In the paintings? Yeah. At the, the things that you're fascinated with in the environment, like the water stains, the accidental things, the turning things, you know, on, on the side, finding the um, paper that had like, you know, had been damaged. Uh, and I was thinking in terms of that it isn't violence, it's more like this corruption that you kind of aestheticize. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't see it that way, you know. Um, you know, the thing is, is that sometimes uh, when, like the like the, the when the Ho Chi Minh City paintings were in New York City, Ken Johnson was talking about how gentle and ephemeral they were, you know. And sometimes the first time I saw the, a burlap painting in the room with a bunch of oil paintings, the burlap painting looked like it could rip their faces off. I was really kind of amazed at how violent it looked. Um, but. Uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know how to answer it. I don't, I don't really think about them that way. Um, but I know that when I used to paint, you know, it, it had, there, there was, uh, you know, I would really rough the paintings up. I even stabbed one one time, which I mentioned, I mean, after art school. I mean, everybody stabs them in art school, but, um, you know, uh, they were, they came about, they were roughed up a lot. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, just kind of a seething person, you know. <laughs> Found a way to be gentle with me and, and let the work seethe for me or something. I don't, I really don't know. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, hi. Uh, can you say something about um, the fact that the, the paintings, you keep calling them paintings, and they're on structures, but a lot of the source material that you're looking at besides the architecture is stuff that's just kind of draped or found, but that you still sort of Seem really committed to the idea of making a painting that's hung on the wall, even though know, it's just constructed with cloth. Well, if that one of those that last painting that was hanging off the wall stays, um, it'll be the first one. Um, it's kind of like a little bit. It feels a little bit like you know the. You know, there's old maps where there's monsters after a waterfall at the end of the ro the, 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 the earth. Like, I'm, I'm still kind of like, if I get off the stretcher, I don't, I, just, I don't know where that is, and I'm afraid. I don't even know if I'm afraid. It's like, I'm, uh, I like, I, I really like not being in a hurry, you know. Um, in another review, somebody said that the work was cautious, and I thought, but yeah, that's that's what I'm enjoying. I'm enjoying like moving really cautiously. So you know, if it happens, it happens. But but it's it's uh, you know there's some you know the uh, they're they're kind of about they're kind of about not making an image, 
not worrying about originality. They're kind of really much about being dictated by this thing that I found myself in the middle of and trying to figure it out and and what it what is it, what what the process what what the activity is informing me about whatever else I'm interested in. It's almost like it's this process where I can filter experience through it. You know, uh, it's I, I don't. It, it, I just don't see it as it, I'm, it's not very product or I'm not very product oriented. I'm certainly not image oriented, um, which is one of the things that's so weird about doing these lectures because you're showing all these images of your work, and for me, they 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 inform the body just as much as they inform the eye. I'm, you know, they're really about that. Uh, that how that's how I see them anyway. Bales. I think about what kind of bringing a certain sense of nostalgia back into the modern would be when it doesn't have melancholy involved. You have a sense of memory and weathering and casting your work. I, I, that's the question. I thought of the word nostalgia, but it has a lot of a loaded sense of melancholy or certain but a sense of uh, weathering things past back into modernity. Well, except that, you know, it's kind of like I really started, you know, as soon as the stuff wasn't so white anymore, it started looking like cast concrete to me. Yeah. You know, it, it, it was like, it's not like, uh, it's more like, like to me, it's more Louis Kahn than nostalgia. Yeah. You know, it's much closer to, to a, like, a, a, like its thingness, well, I, I, you know. I do, I do mean nostalgia can start 10 minutes ago. I, 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 I did look at Paris and see what happened to certain modern buildings when they weren't maintained. So, um, weathering and everything. You, know, it, you have a tradition in the modern mind to make it constructively really a novel. So, you seem to be going against the grain when you're just in the area. Yeah, I did figurative paintings through the late 80s and 90s. I always, it's always seemed to go against the grain. Um, yeah, I... I, um, I told you the scouts is a Hmm. <laughs> the figurative work was very nostalgic, so I suppose, you know, there's something about it I can't get rid of, but I'm not, it's not something I'm looking for. Uh, Jim? That's a... Uh, Really interesting talk because it started out by uh, showing uh, paintings of landscapes and still lives. And as the talk progressed, uh, started seeing paintings but also photographs which were roughly divided into landscapes and still lives that uh, related in very specific visual ways to your work. Um, it's, it's interesting to me to hear how interested you are in uh, abstract painting and at the same time talking about how, how these paintings are distilled, distilled of experience and even showing uh, <laughs> visual uh, reference to them. Do you think that um, you think these are um, is this a return of representation, or is this, are you still holding this commitment to uh, abstract? Well, you know, that's a really good question. Um, because you weren't looking at my work, you were looking at a slide lecture. And I think that my idea about a slide lecture comes from what Carter Radcliffe said about artist statements about their work. He said it was, a genre of imaginative literature. And what I decided to do was rather than 
spend a lot of time talking about these images of my work, which I kind of disagree with even having up here. I figured I'd just turn it into a story and do detective work on what my influences are. So it would it would kind of give a hint about the equivalence. But the equivalence of still lifes and landscapes isn't that my paintings are pictures that are like fig figures in landscape. It means that my picture is like uh, a tattered house. It has the same object quality. It's the same abstracted canvas and wood and stripes thing as one of them. Uh, so that's how so that. On the, on the word abstract, how that, um, how that functions. Uh, So what do am I making abstract paintings? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I mean or, or it, 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 if you're taking a specific um, taste or a specific material quality from one thing and transposing it to another, is that a form? Is that a form of representation, or uh, in some way, maybe not pictorial representation, but in a sense, form? You mean like um, you mean like the painting with the burlap and the felt is an abstracted Buddha statue? You mean like that? I mean, I mean they all sort of like the islands uh, and the stream look like your bits of color and, and the large field. You mean that there there were uh, the surface of shark which you uh, evoked with your speaking and the surface of the burlap, which we can see a little bit better. Um, you know, those, those sort of equivalents. You know, the, th the thing that's so interesting about looking at um, abstraction now especially after I had all this time, you know, making representational paintings is that I don't know um, how much you know, how much pictorial just intuition I'm bringing to these paintings. Um, I, you know, sometimes I, I do look at work where um, I'm pretty sure the person never did representational paintings. And I see things that, that they could, you know, that, that they, I see things that are different from me. And sometimes, you know, I wish I had that, and then sometimes I don't. Sometimes I, I, I there, there's, there's a lot of pictorialism in my work that I suspect is there that I, you know, I can't see because, you know, I'm, I'm inside me, uh, you know, so I don't really know. Um, and, you know, it isn't like I'm trying to drum it out. Uh, but um, I think there's, you know, I'm, I, I've drummed it out as far as I, I want to. And uh, whether it, I don't know, I don't know whether I, I, I certainly wouldn't consciously make a return. I mean, any way I, any way I consciously left it, you know, it was like, I mean, I, I did get depressed doing what I was doing, but I didn't really know I was, I didn't even know then I was going to make abstract paintings. I just knew I was going to do something else, you know. Uh. Uh, I, I just want to thank the generosity of, uh, of presenting the, your beautiful photographs alongside the music. It was, it was quite a pleasure. Thank you.